Hey guys, welcome back to the Dead Church series. Throughout this series, we've been talking about what real Christianity looks like according to the Bible. We've been looking at how the modern church looks nothing like what the Bible says real Christianity looks like, and we've been discussing how all this has happened. If you're new to the series, I highly suggest you start at the beginning of the series and work your way through because all these videos are building on top of one another. You can find the link to the entire playlist right here. Now, in the last few videos, I've been talking about how the promises we read in the Bible are conditional promises. That means that they're promises that God made for people who are doing what he says that they should do. A lot of Christians think that God is just saying, I will do this for you, and that it's for anybody who calls themselves a Christian. But the promises in the Bible often have conditions attached to them. For example, in John 14, Jesus said that he makes his home with the people who obey him. He reveals himself to those who obey him. The Father loves those who obey him. It's not for those who believe, it's for those who obey. And that's part of what we've been talking about throughout this series. Now, a few videos ago, we talked about how the Spirit is only given to those who are obeying Jesus. He makes his home with those who obey. In the last video, we discussed how the promises in the New Testament that our prayers will be answered are not for everyone who calls themselves a Christian. Those are also promises only for those who are obeying him and living in righteousness. Those promises are for those who obey Jesus. And in this video, I want to talk about what it means to be taught by the Holy Spirit. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about how do we get taught by the Holy Spirit. Okay, sometimes when we read things written in the New Testament, we read them and it seems really cool and it sounds good, but we don't really understand it. For example, Paul said, in Christ, God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Okay, when you read these words, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, do you know what Paul is talking about? Do you know what those spiritual blessings are? If you use this phrase like many Christians do when you're talking, praying, or singing worship songs, do you even understand what you're saying? Or are you just using the words Paul used? Is Paul just being artistic? Is he just being poetic? Are we supposed to know what Paul is talking about? Or is it something that Paul, as an apostle, understood, but we won't understand until heaven? Is this a verse that we should just be able to quote, or is this a verse that we're supposed to fully understand? Okay, so many times Christians will read Bible verses and just assume that the author was using fluffy, flowery, artistic, and poetic words to make what they're saying sound beautiful. Christians will hear these verses and without really understanding what is being said, they'll say, amen, yes, amen, yes. Okay, they do this because they read the Bible in order to be encouraged or feel good. They read it because they think reading it gives them life. They think that some of the verses we read are simply there to give praise to God, so all they get out of it is a warm feeling and they say amen. But as we already talked about, that's not the purpose of Scripture. Paul said, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is useful for teaching for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, and for training in righteousness. Using the scriptures, the person who serves God will be capable, 
having all that is needed to do every good work. Okay, the purpose of all scripture is for teaching. It's for correction. It's for training in how we should live. It's not just for encouragement. It's not just for giving praise to God. And those verses aren't just being poetic. When people think a verse, a passage, or an entire book of the Bible is just poetic for the sake of being poetic, the answer is simple. You don't understand it. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians, he wasn't just telling them God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just to tell them that. Paul wanted them to understand what he was talking about. He wanted them to understand what those spiritual blessings are. He wanted them to fully understand everything that they have as a result of following Jesus. A few verses later, he said, I never cease giving thanks to God for you. I always remember you in my prayers, asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you spiritual wisdom and revelation so that you will know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you will comprehend the hope to which he has called us and that you will know the riches of his glorious inheritance for his holy people. And you will know that God's power is overwhelmingly great for us who believe. Okay, so... Here we see that Paul is praying for them so that they would have spiritual wisdom and revelation so that they would know God better. He's praying that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened so that they themselves would be able to comprehend the hope to which we are called, so that they themselves would know the riches of God's glorious inheritance for his holy people and so that they themselves would know that God's power is overwhelmingly great for us who believe. Paul doesn't just want people to become Christians. He doesn't just want people to believe in Jesus so they can go to heaven. No, Paul knows that God is offering more. He's offering so much more right now in this life. God is offering the ability for us to know him in a tangible way. Today, most Christians seem to think that becoming a Christian is the end goal. They think this because they think it's all about going to heaven someday. They don't recognize what God is offering to us right now. Paul doesn't want people to just become Christians. He wants them to mature. He wants them to understand. He wants them to have spiritual wisdom. He wants them to have revelation. He says that if they have this spiritual wisdom and revelation, then they will know God better. He wants their spiritual eyes to be opened so that they can see and understand and comprehend and know all of what God is giving to those who follow him. In short, he wants them to understand, comprehend, and know what all those spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are. He doesn't just want us to know that there are spiritual blessings. He wants us to know what those spiritual blessings are. He wants us to understand what God is giving us. He wants us to know what the spiritual reality is and everything that Jesus purchased for us through his death and resurrection. He prays again for them a few chapters later. I ask the Father out of his glorious riches to give you the power to be strong in the inner person through his spirit. 
I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts by faith and that your life will be rooted and grounded in love. And I pray that you and all God's holy people will have the power to comprehend the greatness of Christ's love. How wide and how long and how high and how deep that love is. Christ's love is beyond comprehension. But I pray that you will be able to know that love. Then you can be filled with the fullness of God. Again, this is one of those verses that so many Christians, they read it, they quote it, they say amen to it, and they write it into fluffy, feel-good worship songs. But do they even understand what Paul is saying? He is praying that they would be able to comprehend the greatness of Christ's love, even though it's incomprehensible. Think about that. He wants them to know the unknowable, to comprehend the incomprehensible. He wants them to be able to wrap their minds around something that cannot be wrapped around. And he explains why. If they are strong in the inner person, if Christ makes his home in their hearts, if they are rooted and grounded in love, and if they comprehend the incomprehensible love of Christ, then they can be filled with the fullness of God. The fullness of God. That means they can be filled with all of God. All of God living in them, just like Jesus. Remember, Jesus prayed in John 17 that he wants us to be one. Not just one with each other, though that is part of it, but also one with him and one with the Father in the same way that he himself is one with the Father. That's what Paul is saying here. That kind of oneness with God is only possible when we are strong in the inner person, when Christ makes his home in our hearts, when we are rooted and grounded in love, and when we comprehend the incomprehensible love of Christ. It's the kind of life we see in the early church throughout the book of Acts. That's the kind of life we're supposed to have, and it's only possible if we mature. Paul recorded a similar prayer when he wrote to the Colossians. Because of this, since the day we heard about you, we have not ceased praying for you, asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will live the kind of life that is worthy of and pleases the Lord in every way. You will produce fruit in every good work and grow in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you will not give up when troubles come but you will have patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has made you able to have a share in the inheritance of the Holy Ones in the light. God has rescued us from the power of darkness, and He brought us into the kingdom of His dearly loved Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Here, we see Paul praying that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will and that he would do this through all spiritual wisdom and understanding and that he would do this so that they will live the kind of life God wants and so that they will produce fruit in good works and so that they will grow in the knowledge of God so that they will be strengthened with all power and so that they will not give up when troubles come, but rather have patience with joy and thankfulness. Paul wants them to know God's will. Okay, we talked about that in the last video when we were talking about prayer. 
A lot of Christians think that God's will is some secret thing that we can't know. So then when they're praying for things, they're shooting in the dark, hoping that what they're praying is in line with God's will. But then if their prayer isn't answered, they just say, well, I guess it wasn't God's will. Guys, that's not how it's supposed to be. Paul is saying here and in other places that we should know God's will. The phrase God's will simply means what God wants. And here he's explaining that we can be filled with the knowledge of what God wants by having spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that it will lead to us living the kind of life God wants with good works. It will lead to us growing in the knowledge of God, in strength and perseverance. In short, if we grow in knowing what God wants, then we will grow in living the kind of life God wants. It makes sense. Another thing many Christians often don't understand is that when Paul and the other apostles talk about the knowledge of God, they're not talking about knowing the correct facts, the right information, and the correct doctrines and theologies. The word knowledge doesn't mean knowledge like we often mean knowledge today. The Greek word translated knowledge was referring to a personal experiential knowledge. In other words, Paul isn't saying he wants us to grow in knowing about God. He wants us to grow in knowing God. We should be people who know God, not just about God, in the same way that I know my wife, Tess. I know her personally. I know what she likes. I know what she doesn't like. I know what she cares about. I talk to her. I listen to her. She tells me her deepest secret thoughts. I know what she wants. I spend nearly every moment with her. I know her personally. I don't merely know about her as if I read about her in some book. But that's often how we treat God today. It's more like we read about him in the Bible and learn things about him. We store up information, facts, doctrines, and theologies, but we don't know him. Paul wants us to know God not just about God. And Paul is saying that knowing God comes from spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul records one final prayer at the end of Colossians. This time it's the prayer of a rather unknown person who was a friend of Paul. He says, Epaphras, a slave of Jesus Christ from your city, also greets you. He always prays earnestly for you that you will grow to be spiritually mature and fully assured in all the will of God. This guy, Epaphras, who is from the city of Colossae, was also praying for the people in his city. He was praying that they would grow to be spiritually mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Again, we're supposed to be people who know God's will, people who know what God wants. So Paul and Epaphras and many of the other apostles all talk about spiritual maturity. And throughout these prayers, we can see a glimpse of what spiritual maturity looks like. We should have spiritual wisdom. We should be receiving revelations from God. In other words, God opening our eyes to reveal something to us, something new or something that we previously didn't understand. We should be people who fully comprehend, that is, fully understand the hope we've been called to. We should be people who know and understand the riches of our inheritance. We should be people who experientially know that God's power is overwhelmingly great for us. We should be people who fully understand and comprehend the incomprehensible love of Jesus. 
we should be people who are filled with the fullness of God. In other words, all of God living in us. We should be people who are filled with the experiential knowledge of God's will, knowing what God wants in all times, in all circumstances. We should be people who have all understanding, knowing more than just the facts and the verses, but understanding what they mean and understanding what the spiritual reality is and what all of our blessings are in the heavenly places. And all of this should result in us living the kind of life God wants, producing the kind of fruit God wants, growing in knowing God personally, being strengthened with all power and persevering through troubles with patience, joy, and thankfulness. As people who are born again, born of the Spirit, not born of the flesh, we should be spiritual people with spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding, and spiritual maturity. We should not be people who just quote Bible verses. A lot of Christians quote Bible verses without understanding what those verses are saying. A lot of Christians take verses from the Bible out of context. They use them to remind themselves of God's promises, but they don't even understand what those promises are or what those verses are saying. Christians today talk in fluffy, nonsensical Christianese where they toss around words and phrases from the Bible and act as if saying the right words is all that matters. But they don't actually understand what those words mean, and they don't comprehend the depth of what those words are talking about. Christians today are so comfortable not understanding the spiritual things the Bible says we should understand. Christians today are too comfortable quoting Bible verses and sounding spiritual when really they have no idea what they're even saying. They use words that have no real tangible meaning to them. They don't understand what Paul is saying, and they don't understand what they're talking about when they use those same phrases. Christians will say long, drawn-out, feel-good, poetic things that really have no substance to them at all. They use words that don't make sense. They use phrases that don't make sense. They don't really know what they're saying and no one really gets any substantial help from it because it really doesn't have any meaning at all. But it feels good, it sounds good, and it uses words and phrases from the Bible, so it must be good, right? Do you understand that when the apostles wrote these things, they did not intend it to be a feel-good, poetic, fluffy encouragement with no real tangible substance? They weren't trying to be poetic. They were trying to communicate something to you that you're supposed to understand and fully comprehend. Building others up doesn't mean telling them nonsensical things that sound good and feel right. Building others up means telling them something that they can understand and comprehend. It has substance, and the truth being communicated helps that person. But if that person doesn't understand any type of communicated thought, then you're just a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. You're benefiting no one. If you have to use Christianese and fluffy poetic words from the Bible and you can't put it into your own words in modern English and communicate a real thought in which the other person will understand the substance of what you're saying, then you don't actually know what you're talking about. Furthermore, you haven't built that person up, you haven't communicated truth, and you haven't helped anyone. We're not supposed to be people who merely say God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
We're not supposed to be people who merely vomit up all the Bible verses we've read and say those words as if the words themselves have some sort of magical power in them. We're supposed to be people who know what those spiritual blessings are. We're supposed to be people who fully understand the hope we have and the inheritance that we are receiving from God as His children. We're supposed to be people who are filled with the fullness of God, just like Jesus. In other words, we're supposed to be people who know what we're talking about. We're supposed to be people who have spiritual wisdom. We're supposed to be people who have understanding, who understand what we're saying and thinking and understand what the Bible is saying. So then the question is, how do we get spiritual wisdom? How do we come to know what all of our spiritual blessings are? How do we comprehend the hope we're called to? How do we learn what our inheritance is? In other words, how do we understand the secret things of God that Paul says we're supposed to understand? Well, Paul tells us. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul tells us where we can get this kind of wisdom and understanding. He says... However, we speak wisdom to those who are mature. But this wisdom is not from this world or from the rulers of this world who are passing away. We speak God's secret wisdom, which He has kept hidden. Before the world began, God planned this wisdom for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written in the scriptures, no eye has ever seen this, and no ear has ever heard about it. No human heart has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed to us these things through the Spirit. The Spirit searches out all things, even the deep secrets of God. Who knows the thoughts that another person has? Only a person's spirit that lives within him knows his thoughts. It is the same with God. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we did not receive the Spirit of the world but we receive the Spirit that is from God, so that we can know all that God has freely given us. And we speak about these things, not with words taught us by human wisdom, but with words taught us by the Spirit, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. A natural person does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. That person thinks they are foolish and cannot understand them because they can only be discerned by the Spirit. The spiritual person is able to discern all things, but no one can discern Him. The Scripture says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been able to advise Him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul is saying in this passage that those who are spiritual receive spiritual wisdom directly from the Spirit. That spiritual wisdom is God's secret wisdom, His secret thoughts, His secret plans, things He's never told anyone about, things the spiritual rulers of this age didn't understand because if they had understood, they would never have crucified Jesus. No eye has seen these secret things. No ear has heard these secret things. But God reveals them to us through the Spirit. So Paul is saying we receive this wisdom and understanding through the Spirit because the Spirit knows the secret thoughts of God. Just like you can't read my thoughts, no other person, not even my wife who knows me better than anyone else, can read my thoughts and know what I'm thinking. 
the only one who knows what I'm thinking is the spirit inside of me. And Paul is saying that it's the same way with God. No one knows God's secret thoughts. No one knows his secret plans and his secret desires. No one knows the things that God has kept hidden deep inside his own mind. But God gave us his spirit, that same spirit that does know his secret thoughts, the same spirit that does know his secret plans and his secret desires. So now, through the Spirit, we can know His secret thoughts. We can know His secret plans. We can know His secret desires. And as Paul said, we can know all that God has freely given us. In other words, we can know all those spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. We can know what our inheritance is. We can know what God is giving us. Paul continues explaining that because we learn these secret thoughts of God through the Spirit, we have an understanding and comprehension of things that no natural person is able to understand and comprehend. In other words, people who aren't true Christians, true mature Christians who don't have the Spirit of God, they think it's foolish. They think it's stupid. They're not able to understand it, and they will refuse to accept it. Only a spiritual person, someone born of the Spirit, who has died with Jesus and has risen with Him into a new life, only that kind of person is able to understand it, and only a spiritual person is able to accept it. And then Paul summarizes by quoting Isaiah 40. He says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? But then Paul gives an incredible answer. We have the mind of Christ. Because we have the mind of Christ, we can know the mind of the Lord. In this section, Paul is providing the answer for how Christians are supposed to understand what it means to have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's explaining how we receive all those things we mentioned earlier, how we can have spiritual wisdom, how we can receive revelations from God, how we can comprehend the hope to which we've been called, how we know and understand the riches of our inheritance, how we experientially know that God's power is overwhelmingly great for us how we fully understand and comprehend the incomprehensible love of Jesus, how we are filled with the fullness of God, how we are filled with the knowledge of God's will, and how we can have all understanding. It comes through knowing the secret thoughts of God, the thoughts that only the Spirit within Him can know. It comes because as we become one with Jesus and one with the Father, we receive the mind of Christ. And if we receive the mind of Christ, then we know His thoughts. We gain His perspective. We understand His secrets and we know what He is giving us. The Spirit of God knows all the depths of the secrets of God. And He makes those secrets available to us. The Spirit causes us to understand things. He reveals our inheritance to us in a way that we can comprehend it, not just talk about it. He opens our eyes to fathom the depths of what God is offering us. Okay, we read Paul's letters and we see that he clearly had a deep understanding of spiritual things that we still don't understand even though we have his letters. Okay, He understood what God was doing with Israel. He understood what God was doing with the Gentiles. He understood what was coming in the future. He understood what it means to be the bride of Christ. He understood our inheritance. He understood what God is offering us. He understood what's going to happen when Jesus returns. He understood what kind of bodies we will have in heaven. He understood it. It made sense to him. In 1 Corinthians 2, he is explaining how he understood all of this. 
And he's telling us that this kind of understanding is available to us too. He wasn't just something that Paul experienced as an apostle. It's something God offers to everyone who has his spirit. We can only know what our spiritual blessings are if we have the Holy Spirit revealing these things to us. This is what Paul calls spiritual wisdom. Paul said, no eye has seen it, no ear has heard it. That means no Christian book will teach you these things. No sermon is going to explain this to you. No pastor will help you understand. It's not something that you can be taught by a person. It's not something you can learn through studying. It's something you can only have if the Spirit opens your eyes and gives it to you. The secret things of God are only available to us through the Spirit. But so many Christians are taking the wrong approach. Here's an example. What is the most confusing book in the Bible that it seems like no one understands. It's the book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation is this crazy roller coaster story of this vision that the Apostle John had. He describes scrolls being opened, horses being sent out on the earth the sun becoming black, the moon turning to blood, earthquakes, locusts from the abyss, wars in heaven. He describes trumpets and plagues, bowls and plagues, signs appearing in heaven, a beast rising from the sea, a beast rising from the earth, an image that can talk, the mark of the beast, a woman called the whore of Babylon, and a beast she's riding. He describes a rider on a white horse, a judgment day, a lake of fire, a second death, a new Jerusalem, and rivers of life, and so many other things. It doesn't matter how many books you read about Revelation. It doesn't matter how many sermons you listen to. It doesn't matter how much research you do online. It seems like no one really understands what Revelation is talking about. Yet, at the end of the book, it says, Blessed is the one who obeys the words of prophecy in this book. How are we supposed to obey the words of the book of Revelation when no one even understands the book of Revelation? Well, scattered throughout the book of Revelation, John provides the answer, but most Christians don't understand what it means. Throughout the first few chapters of Revelation, John repeats a phrase over and over. He says, Everyone who has ears should hear and obey what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a phrase similar to what Jesus said when he told parables. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. John said it again later in Revelation. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is a phrase that Jesus and John both use to say the same thing. They're saying, you need to understand what I'm saying. John says some similar things elsewhere in Revelation. We've all heard of the mark of the beast. We know that it says that everyone who accepts the mark of the beast will be thrown into the lake of fire. And countless Christian books, videos, movies, blogs, and sermons all speculate and try to figure out what the mark of the beast could possibly be. But John said something so simple and so often overlooked or misunderstood. He said, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, which is the number of a man. Its number is 666. Did you catch it? He says something similar about the beast that the prostitute is riding. He says, You need a wise mind to understand this. When he talks about the prostitute herself, he says, 
on her forehead a name was written that was a mystery. When John says the name on her forehead is a mystery, he uses the same word Paul used, which is translated as secret. Paul said, we speak God's secret wisdom. The word mystery or secret is a word Paul used over and over again in his letters whenever he would explain something that the Spirit had revealed to him. For example, in Romans 11, 25-36, he reveals a mystery about how God allowed Israel to become hardened in order for him to be able to rescue the Gentiles. In Ephesians 3, 4-6, Paul reveals a mystery about how the Gentiles are now co-heirs with the Jews, belonging to the same body and sharing together in the same promise. In Ephesians 5, 25-33, Paul reveals another mystery. He reveals that marriage is about Christ and the church. And when Paul says that, he means it's so much deeper than just saying, oh yeah, the church is the bride of Christ, the church is the bride of Christ. He's saying, no, there is a profound secret there you need to understand. And in Colossians 1, 25-29, Paul reveals yet another mystery. He says that this is the mystery that was hidden from ages and generations, but now is made known to God's holy people. He says this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our hope of having glory is that we have Christ in us. Okay, these are just a few examples. Paul used the word mystery or secret over and over again. Every time he uses this word, he's telling his readers that what he is explaining is a deep secret of God that was revealed to him through the Spirit. It's something that even when Paul tells us these mysteries, we won't be able to understand it without the Spirit showing it to us as well. In other words, it's not surface level. They're not just Bible verses that we're supposed to quote. It's easy for us to say, the church is the bride of Christ, the church is the bride of Christ. But do you understand what that means? That means the two become one flesh. That means when he died, the church died. When he rose, the church rose. His blood pumps through our veins. His life is the life we're living. It's no longer us who live. It's Christ living in us. We became one with Jesus in the same way that he is one with the Father. And yet all Paul says is, this is a mystery. I'm talking about Christ in the church. And then he continues. And so many Christians read it and they just see the surface level and they don't see the depth of what Paul is saying. These mysteries are things that we're supposed to understand. We're supposed to really get it and we're supposed to comprehend the significance of what Paul is saying. That's what a mystery is in the Bible. It's something that requires spiritual wisdom, the kind of wisdom Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 2. The kind of wisdom where we understand things through the Spirit that no natural person can understand or accept. So, when John says the name of the prostitute is a mystery, he's saying the same thing Paul is saying. This is a hidden thing that requires spiritual wisdom. Not the world's wisdom, but spiritual wisdom, where the Spirit tells us God's secrets, His mysteries. The key to understanding the book of Revelation and obeying it is in having true spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding, knowing God's secret thoughts. When John says, this calls for wisdom, or you need a wise mind to understand this, he's referring to spiritual wisdom. He's referring to spiritual understanding. He's talking about the kind of wisdom and understanding we receive from the Spirit when we mature and become spiritual people. The book of Revelation isn't supposed to be so confusing. John is saying, you're supposed to understand this. If you have ears to hear, you will get to the point where you understand it. 
but you have to have wisdom in order to understand it. The book of Revelation is supposed to make sense, but we are supposed to have spiritual wisdom. Essentially, John is saying, you won't understand this unless you are a mature spiritual person, someone who thinks and acts like Jesus. Unfortunately, that's not the approach most Christians take. Instead of recognizing this, most Christians try to solve the riddles using their own human intellect. They come up with different math equations. They try to convert letters to numbers. They look at different symbology. They speculate about some future microchip. The list goes on and on and on. Most Christians seem to be mistaking wisdom or understanding with intellect. This is not the kind of wisdom John is telling us to have. Okay, part of the problem is that in the church today, Christianity has been hijacked by intellectual scholars who tell us that the only way to grow in understanding is by following their intellectual scholarly methods. Christians have begun to believe that if they want to understand the Bible, they have to go to seminary, they have to take Bible classes, they have to read Christian books, and they have to be taught by people who know the ancient languages in which the Bible was written. Instead of learning the will of God, in other words, what God wants, like Paul said we should be doing, Christians are learning human traditions, human doctrines, and human theology. The intellectual educators in the world have hijacked Christianity in order to amass for themselves a large following of people. For example, John Calvin was an intellectual, educated, secular scholar who then, quote, became a Christian and taught people that they need to read the Bible using the same methods that he used to study secular, non-spiritual literature. And people still assume he is right and follow his methods to this day. And he's just one example. The result of this is that the church is now filled with Christians who think that in order to understand the Bible, in order to grow in wisdom, in order to grow in understanding, and in order to know God better, they have to learn and follow the intellectual methods of these well-educated scholarly men. This is the exact opposite of what Jesus said. In that same hour, Jesus was full of joy in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the people who are wise and learned, but you have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, because this is what you really wanted. Do you see what Jesus just said? Do you realize that what Jesus just said is a direct contradiction of some of the theology and doctrine that those well-educated men are teaching? Jesus didn't just say, I praise you, Father, because you have revealed the truth to little children. Jesus said, I praise you, Father, because you have hidden the truth from the people who are wise and learned. Jesus is saying that God the Father is actively hiding the truth from people who try to find the truth using worldly, scholarly, and intellectual methods. God himself is hiding the truth from them. Let that sink in for a second. Most Christians would have a problem with anyone saying that God would hide the truth from someone. They think that God would never do that. But Jesus himself said that God is the one who's hiding it. That's the same thing Jesus said about why he spoke in parables. The church tells us that Jesus spoke in parables as a method of helping people understand. But Jesus tells us the opposite. Jesus said, I tell everything by using parables so that 
They will look and look, but they will not learn. They will listen and listen, but they will not understand. Otherwise, they might return to me and be forgiven. Where does that verse fit in with the theology the church is teaching? Jesus wants people who are all in. He wants people who are ready to drop everything and follow him completely like his disciples did. He wants loyalty. He wants faithfulness. He wants people who will obey his radical commands out of a deep love for him. That's why he would speak in parables and then say, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He didn't want everyone to understand. He only wanted those who would truly listen, those who would obey. Jesus isn't looking for people who are just trying to avoid hell. Jesus isn't looking for people who are just trying to get all their facts straight. Jesus isn't looking to reward the intellectuals for being smarter than everyone else. Those with a high IQ and a PhD are not going to be the only ones who are capable of calculating the mark of the beast, understanding all of our spiritual blessings, comprehending the love of Christ, knowing our inheritance as saints, and unraveling the secrets of God. Their wisdom is not what God values. When Paul wrote about the wisdom we receive through the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2, he also said this, it is written in the scriptures, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the wise person? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this world? God has made the wisdom of the world foolish. God wisely determined that the world would not know God through its own wisdom. Brothers and sisters, look at what you were when God called you. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you had great influence. Not many of you were of high social status. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose what the world thinks is unimportant and what the world looks down on and thinks is nothing in order to destroy what the world thinks is important. God did this so that no one can brag in his presence. Because of God, you are united with Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. According to Jesus and according to Paul, God did not create a spiritual reality in which the truth can be found through intelligence, education, scholarship, seminaries, or anything else that the world considers important. God hides the truth from those who are trying to find the truth through those means. Jesus didn't come to call the wise and intelligence. He came to destroy the wisdom of the wise and destroy the intelligence of the intelligent. The wisdom of the world is foolishness. Why have we allowed the intellectual educated men to hijack Christianity? Jesus changed the entire world with a group of fishermen, tax collectors, and zealots. When Peter and John stood on trial, the leaders were amazed because they realized that Peter and John were just common, uneducated men. True spiritual wisdom is not something we receive through education, intelligence, or hermeneutics. If that's how you're searching for understanding, Jesus and Paul are both saying that God himself is going to hide the truth from you. If you're doing something that's making God hide the truth from you, you can be sure that you will never find the truth unless you change. No one will ever understand the mark of the beast, the whore of Babylon, what the beast is, or how to obey the book of Revelation by trying to solve it like some human puzzle. 
No one will ever understand our spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, the hope we're called to, our inheritance, God's power, or God's will by taking classes, reading books, listening to sermons, going to seminary, or studying theology. True spiritual wisdom only comes through knowing the secret thoughts of God. True understanding only comes through the Spirit. Unless God shows you, you will never figure it out, even if you think you did. Okay, it's possible to understand our spiritual blessings. It's possible to fully comprehend the hope we're called to. It's possible to know what our inheritance is. It's possible to understand the book of Revelation and know what the mark of the beast is and who the prostitute is. All of this understanding and all of this wisdom is available to us through the Spirit of God. But we need to know how to learn from the Spirit. We need to know how to become people who receive this kind of wisdom and understanding from God's Spirit. Not everyone who thinks they're a Christian is going to receive it. It's only for those who are spiritual. And right after Paul told the Corinthians about receiving spiritual wisdom through the Spirit, he told them that they were not spiritual. And he told them that he couldn't tell them about this spiritual wisdom because they weren't ready to receive it because they were still natural. And natural people can't receive it. So even though the Corinthians were Christians, they weren't receiving the spiritual wisdom. And the entire book of 1 Corinthians is telling them how they should change in order to start receiving that kind of wisdom. If we want to receive spiritual wisdom, we need to know what the Bible says about how to receive spiritual wisdom. And we'll look at what the Bible says about that in the next video. For now, go back to those prayers we looked at at the beginning of this video. Look at what Paul was praying for the Ephesians, the Colossians, and other prayers recorded throughout the New Testament. He was praying that they would grow in the knowledge of God. He was praying that they would know God's will. He was praying that they would have all spiritual wisdom and all spiritual understanding. He was praying that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. He was praying that they would know all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He was praying that they would mature. Make these your prayers. Look at what Paul prayed in these passages and others and begin to pray the same thing. Pray for yourself, but not just for yourself. That's not love. Pray for others. Pray for other brothers and sisters. Pray for anyone you know. Pray that the body of Christ would grow into this kind of maturity. Make this your daily prayer. Ask and keep on asking. Let this become the prayer that the entire body of Christ begins to ask God. And may his body grow. Father, I ask for anyone watching this video, for anyone who truly wants to follow you, for anyone who is your child, I ask that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. I ask that you would give them spiritual wisdom and understanding. God, I ask that your body would grow that your body would grow out of the slumber it's been in for so many years and that it would step into maturity and mature into the image of Christ and begin to look like Him and act like Him and think like Him. Father, please let your children begin to see the truth. Give spiritual wisdom and understanding to your children. Teach them the way they should walk so that they will know this spiritual wisdom. Show them the way to live. Show them what they have to do in order to live in it and teach them things that no natural person will accept. 
God, let your body grow and mature into the image of Christ so that it's no longer tossed around by all these false teachers, all these educated men, but so that it can stand firm, no longer thrown about by every new wave of teaching. God, let your body begin to look like Jesus. Let your body begin to live like Jesus and act like him so that it is you living in us, your blood in our veins, your life in us, us joined to you as the bride of Christ, becoming one flesh with you, one with you the same way you are one with the Father, part of your family. God, let this happen. Let us see it happen in our generation. Let your kingdom come on earth and let what you want be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Let us see your kingdom, Father. Send your spirit. Teach us through your spirit and grow your body into what you intended and not some religion. In Jesus' name I ask.